Warning, this podcast contains descriptions of murder, torture and abuse. As a result, it may not be suitable for everybody. Cape Town, South Africa. The second most populous city in South Africa after Johannesburg and also legislative capital of South Africa. Colloquially named the Mother City, it's the largest city of Western Cape Province and forms part of the city of Cape Town Metropolitan Municipality. The Parliament in South Africa is situated in Cape Town. Listen to the hometown murders of Marlene Lindbergh, a South African murder, more commonly known as the Scissor Murderess. She was 18 years old in 1974 when she was hired and killed Martinez Clogo and stabbed Susanna Magdanella van der Linde, the wife of Lindbergh's 47-year-old lover, Christian van der Linde, to death with a pair of scissors. At 19, she was then the youngest woman to be convicted of murder in South Africa. Both Lindbergh and Martinez Klenger received the death penalty, but this was later set aside and she served 11 years of her 20th year sentence in Polesmoor Prison outside Cape Town. In February 1972, Lemberg began her first job as a clerical assistant receptionist at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Rosebosch, South Africa, in Cape Town. She started work in the orthopaedic workshop alongside Christian van der Linde. Van der Linde was the workshop's chief technician and Lemberg, a bright, intelligent and attractive 16-year-old, was apparently drawn to him from the start. Lindbergh's upbringing have both ultra-conservative and strict. Her father was puritanical and a man who rarely displayed any affection towards his daughters. She was not allowed to socialise and she'd never been to the cinema during a time when she was at high school. She was a very intelligent young girl academically and often came first in her class but no experience of boys or men. She was very naive and innocent and tried hard to get attention via her studies. She was drawn to van der Linde, a person she saw as being warm and friendly father figure. She related, recalled, he said, welcome and my heart beat faster. Van der Linde and Lindbergh struck up a father-daughter type relationship which grew closer as the months passed. In April 1973, a year after they first met, the couple began an affair. Throughout the remainder of 1973, Lindbergh and van der Linde continued to meet in secret at Rhodes Bosch Common and Pardon Land. Then early in 1974, the intimacy stopped. Van der Linde suspected they were being watched because his wife was receiving anonymous telephone calls. Despite the fact that van der Linde had declared that he would never leave his wife and family, Lindbergh was convinced that the only obstacle to them having a more permanent relationship was the presence of van der Linde's wife, Susanna. By July 1974, Lindbergh was becoming desperate and started talking about leaving Cape Town. Christian van der Linde persuaded her not to but by September she had finally tired of the situation and decided to confront Susanna. Lindbergh called and explained that she and Christian was very much in love and were seeing each other every night. She wanted to know what Susanna van der Linde intended doing but Susanna hung up on her. A few weeks later Lindbergh telephoned again this time she made an appointment to go and see her. They met in Belleville in early October. Initially, 
Lindbergh had hoped that she and Susanna would come to some sort of arrangement concerning Christian, but this meeting was to change all those ideas. Not only did Susanna tell Lindbergh that she would never give her husband a divorce because of the children, she also added she didn't mind playing second fiddle as long as Lindbergh didn't mind either. It was obvious to Lindbergh that Susanna was prepared to do anything to keep her husband. It was around this time that Lindbergh met Martianus Charles Chogu, who had lost a leg in a motor car accident. He had come to the orthopaedic workshop to have an artificial limb fitted. He was unemployed and his disabilities, both physical and social, had destroyed his self-esteem. This made him in particular susceptible to Lindbergh's approaches. Lindbergh first contacted Chago by letter, which she wrote to him care of Solis Trading Store, his local shop. In the letter, she asked him to come and see her at the orthopaedic workshop, adding if he was clever, he could still earn some good money. When he arrived at the workshop, Lindbergh gave him one rand and asked him to meet her at Rogesburg Town Hall at 7pm that evening, at which time she gave him a bottle of gin and said she wanted him to murder a woman for her. Cho Geek declined at first, saying that he was afraid of being sent to the gallows. After some discussion, Choberg Chago finally agreed to Lindbergh's request. Several days later, he went to the address in Boston, Belleville, which Lindbergh had given to him, later claiming that he planned to warn Susanna van der Linde that her life was in danger. But instead of warning Susanna of Lindbergh's plan, he simply asked her to some more money. She said she didn't have any and went back inside the house. A week later, Shogo and Legbert met in Rochebosch once more. This time he admitted that he was too afraid to go through with the murder. Lemberg gave him a radio and promised she would help him receive an artificial limb if he did away with Susanna. Shago went to Belleville again, but on this occasion he simply walked past the house and made no attempt to enter. Shortly afterwards, Lengbuk sent Chago a second letter, again urging him to go through with a murder using the knife he had to. She got another message to him asking him to telephone her at work. During the subsequent conversation, Lemberg insisted that Chogo go through with the murder. She promised to have give him a car and have sex with him after the crime had been committed. On October 1974, Lindbergh handed her a notice to the hospital and told Van der Linde that she was going to leave Cape Town. On the 24th of October, Lindbergh collected Chogo from his home in retreat and drove him to Belleville in her car. He was armed with a hammer which he was used to kill Susanna. Lindbergh dropped him off in the vicinity of Boston and sped away. Shortly afterwards, Chogo was spotted by Susanna. She was alarmed because she'd seen him in the area on more than one occasion. She telephoned the Belleville police station and Chago was picked up by the police after two blocks. At the police station he was beaten and warned not to return to the area. In a face of repeated failure, Leiburg decided to take matters into her own hands. A few days after Chago's failed attempt, she approached Rob Newman, a 20-year-old engineering student whom she knew, and asked to borrow his Lamer pistol. When he refused, she asked if she could kill somebody for her. Again, he refused, but on October 28th, Newman's pistol was stolen from his room. He reported the theft to the police and suggested Lemberg was his likely suspect. Around 8.30am on the morning of the 4th of November 1974, Lainberg arrived at Shago's home. She said that her car was packed and she was on her way to Johannesburg, but before she left she needed Shago to come with her to Van der Linde's house. He claimed in a statement that it wasn't until she handed him the Lima police pistol on his way to Belleville that he realised she wasn't going to say goodbye. They arrived outside the house at just after 9am 
Susanna was alone inside. From this point on, she goes and Lemberg's account on what followed differed. Lemberg claimed she got out of the car, rang the doorbell and returned to the car where Chago entered the home alone and committed the murder. Chago, however, maintained they acted together throughout. Chago's account was supported by a neighbour of the Vandalins, Mrs Morass. On the morning in question, Morass had walked past Labour's Whiteford Anglica twice in the space of 10 to 12 minutes while his parks outside the Vandalin house and on both occasions the car was empty. Chago said that after Lemberg rang the bell they went to the house together. When Susanna saw them both she became frightened and threatened to call the police. She attempted to get away but was tripped by Leiberg, fell and hit her head on the floor. When Susanna was on the floor, Lemberg struck her on the jaw with the butt of the pistol. On Lemberg's instructions, Chago began to throttle the self-semi-conscious Susanna. Lemberg was then given a pair of scissors she had taken from the sideboard. Chago said he remembered stabbing Susanna three times, but the pathologist later noted seven stab wounds, six of which penetrated the chest. After the murder, Lemberg squirted green dye over Chago using a gas pistol belonging to Susanna. After warning Chago that she would deny any involvement in the murder if he went to the police, Lemberg took him home. She set off for Johannesburg, collecting two speeding tickets at Beaufort West on the journey. When the police brought van der Lind home to identify his wife, he casually turned the body with his foot and said that was his wife. This was reported at the time by the police officer's president as Callas almost had been expecting it. It had been suggested at the time that van der Lind had influenced Lindbergh in order to get her to murder his wife, but this was not proven and he was never charged. Chaburg Bear kept both the pistol that was used at the scene of the crime, which was later seized by the police. When he asked why he didn't discard them, he replied it was dangerous to throw pistols away. Susanna Vindelin's body was discovered about 1pm by her daughter. Van der Lin attempted to telephone his wife a number of times that morning and eventually became concerned when there was no reply. He spoke to his daughter Zelda, who worked at Tyberg Hospital, and asked her to go home during her lunch break to see if there was anything wrong. When she arrived home, the house was locked up, but through a window she caught a glimpse of her mother lying on the floor. Police immediately began an intensive murder investigation. Their chief suspect was a crippled coloured man who had been seen in the area at least two occasions prior to the murder. In fact, it was because of Chago that Susanna van der Lind insisted that her husband buy her a dye pistol. At first, nobody considered that Lindbergh was involved or that she may have hired an assassin. For the next week, two police efforts to establish Chago's identity and whereabouts proved fruitless. But around 7.30am on the 13th of November, a breakthrough occurred. Lieutenant Roland Frory D of the Brixton murder and robbery squad in Johannesburg went to see Lemberg, who was staying at her uncle's house in Brenston, asked her to accompany him to Brixton police station where he wished to ask her some question. Lemberg admitted on the way to the police station that van der Lind was her lover. She had added that she had expected the police to contact her ever since she first heard her of the murders. The trial of Chaco and Lindbergh began at Cape Town and Supreme Court on the 5th of March 1975. The trial drew hundreds of spectators who fought for seats in the packed courtroom. After hearing, which lasted around seven days, during which the state called more than 30 witnesses, the judge, Justice de Mont, and his two assessors, A.J. Van Neerkirk and Van der Vale Smith, deliberated overnight and returned verdicts of guilty for both accused. The court of no extenuated circumstances and Leiberg and Clu- uh, Chago were sentenced to death. Two months later, the death was re- case was reopened on appeal. 
In July 1975, the death sentence was set aside. Lindbergh was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment and Chogo to 15 years. Chogo, however, was released in June 1986 and became an evangelical preacher, while Lindbergh was paroled in December of the same year. Lindbergh ended her life in October 2015, five days before her 60th birthday. She was suffering from osteoporosis for years and being diagnosed with breast cancer. She could no longer take the severe pain which she was in and committed suicide at her home in relative obscurity. Chago died in a car accident in 1992 on the N7 near Neuras in the Western Cape. The third member of the tra- tragic triangle, Christian van der Linde, died a lonely man in 1983. After the trial, he moved to Cruz Drop so that he could visit his wife's grave on her family's farm. He later expressed remorse of having to have met Marlene Lindbergh. Thank you for everybody who's listened to this episode. This episode has been researched, written and hosted by me, Andrew Knight. Sound, music and editing has been provided by Harry Edmondson. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere where you listen to your podcast. This allows the episode to be downloaded automatically as soon as it's released. Please reach out to us on the social media. We're at Hometown Murders on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Please support the show by leaving a five-star rating or a review. It really does help. 